Welcome to the open software jungle, and it is a jungle, and there are a few rules of the jungle. Let's take a look at the seven laws of the open jungle. The first one, the first law, commoditize your compliments. Back in the 90s, when I worked at Sony, the mantra was synergy. Remember this? Does anyone work at a big company in the 90s? Like synergy, right? Everyone was doing mergers and acquisitions to buy more companies because they were seeking synergy of some sort. You know, it's like if we, if we take two stones and tie them together, maybe they'll float. And uh, I guess, no, actually, that was the principle behind Nokia and Microsoft merging. Uh, so, so anyway, um, companies were getting really, really big. You know, if you think of Vivendi Universal and doing all those acquisitions, they hit, did a huge roll up. Uh, Compaq and HP merged. Um, Time Warner acquired AOL. It was like kind of you know, the deal of the century back in 1999 or 2000 when that occurred. And so we had this drive towards synergy. It turns out synergy was a mirage. And most of those mergers failed. And the this, this sought after benefits, the efficiencies and so forth, never really occurred. They couldn't get the different department managers to look outside of their silo and to work together in a collaborative fashion. So synergy is now kind of a bad word. You don't use that word. It turns out there was a strategy that worked in the 1990s, though. There was a strategy that worked so brilliantly, but everybody was looking at synergy, they missed the point. The winning strategy, I would call beggar thy neighbor. Let me describe what I mean. So we talked about standards and proprietary software and patents, right? We talked about that concept of proprietary, privately owned information and, uh, and open standards. So Craig Burton, a genius and a legend in the programming world, the software world, uh, software theorist, he makes a simple grid. There's two axes, open and closed, and then proprietary and public domain. So down here, on this side, is your patents. Over there on that side would be your standards. And his point is that ubiquity creates infrastructure. Um, there's a terrific article about this subject by Doc Searles, who writes about open source brilliantly. He's an inspiration to me. And I borrowed this diagram from him. So if you have a proprietary closed solution, that's scarce, which means it's going to be very valuable. You're going to make a tremendous amount of money out of it. The standardization process commoditizes that, puts that information in the public domain, and it makes it very hard to monetize. And so uh, this is back to the dilemma I described early in the beginning of the talk, that conflict inherent in the standards process. Everybody wants that personal gain. That's what motivates people. It's not the only motivation to be inventive or creative, but it certainly is one of them. The principle being, if I invent something, I patent it, and I own it, I can extract a profit from that. Once you relinquish that to the public domain, you've given up that monopoly interest. You've lost your ability to extract monopoly rent from it. You've commoditized yourself. No wonder people resist being standardized. So um, the great thing is once you do standardize, that creates infrastructure. Infrastructure being the necessary fundamentals to build businesses on top of. Think of infrastructure in terms of roads and railroads and bridges and so forth. This is you know, more uh, metaphorical use of the word infrastructure, but we, it is still infrastructure that you can build new business upon. So it grows the whole industry when you relinquish things into the public domain and when you make them uh, um, open. But you commoditize yourself in doing it. So for a business, commoditization is a bad outcome. No wonder companies fight so hard to stave off commoditization. No wonder companies fight so hard to control the standards process and steer it their way, as Sony did when I worked there. So now I need to introduce the economic concept of compliments. Now, I don't want it to be confused with compliments. So on the right is a compliment. That's where someone says, nice dress or nice handbag. The compliment are two things that fit together, right? So the purse and the dress fit together in this example. In economics, for some reason, they always use the example of hot dogs and buns. I don't know why. It's not actually a very good example, but I guess it's an easy, sim simple thing for people to hold their heads. You would never eat a hot dog without a bun, or, or maybe you would if you're a low-carb person. But generally speaking, you know, they go together, right? And that's the principle of a compliment. Another example would be uh, uh, laces and shoes. Uh, so they're two products that always get sold together, or always get bundled together, or they add value together. Together, they make themselves more valuable. Um, and probably the better example is tires and cars, because a really a true compliment Without it, you can't consume the other piece, right? So those two, they're necessary for each other. And there's actually an inverse pricing relationship with complements. Uh, so as the price of one goes down, it drives up the price of the other. That's the economic definition of what a complementary good is. So as the price goes down, it drives up the price of the other. Uh, so for instance, here's gas and cars. If the price of gas goes down, more people drive cars. It works perfectly. It's a good illustration of it. So the idea there, the principle of complements is don't commoditize yourself don't commoditize yourself, commoditize your compliment. 
commoditize somebody else's business, and that'll drive up the value of your business. If you can turn your complements into infrastructure, it means you can grow your business faster. This is a key point behind the open game. This is how companies play the open game to win. The earliest example that I could find of this, there may be others in the past, is razors and razor blades. You've heard the metaphor a million times. It's actually cross-subsidy, right? So uh, King Gillette is the guy who invented this. Uh, he didn't invent the safety razor, but he perfected it. But what he really invented was the idea of give away the razors or sell them at super cheap prices because you're going to make money when people buy more razor blades. And this principle works today, for instance, in the video game business. This is the fundamental concept that drives the video game business. You sell the console for very cheap, sometimes below cost, knowing that you're going to make your money up when people buy software or games to play on that console. And so that's the concept of razors and razor blades. It's a good illustration of how you can use a complement to build a business. You can commoditize one complement in order to reap the value, collect the rent elsewhere. The master of this, of course, is Microsoft. So if you think back to the day of the PC, you know, the Department of Justice forced IBM to unbundle software. They couldn't bundle their free operating system, so they needed to sell operating systems. That created a marketplace. Microsoft filled it, and Microsoft did something brilliant. When they created Windows, they noticed that IBM had done a great job of specifying every interface, every component and every, every interface in the PC. When Microsoft licensed Windows, to IBM, they gave them a non-exclusive license, which meant that they could sell that same software to literally hundreds of other manufacturers who all entered the field and used those IBM specifications to build IBM clones. It commoditized the PC, it turned the PC into infrastructure, and Windows became the ubiquitous software that ran on all of them. And why would they do this? Well, everybody needed an operating system, and the demand was for the operating system. The hardware became a commodity. It was interchangeable, and there was no pricing power. This tr inflicted tremendous pain on the hardware companies, tremendous amounts of pain. And they had to work really, really, really hard to compete, to eke out any kind of profit. And so that's where we started this process of cheaper, smaller, faster, better, because it was the only way the PC companies could stay in business. When I worked with Sony, the guys in the PC group were always continuously felt like they were running behind. They said everything on the shelf in the store is already six months obsolete. And all the stuff that we have in the warehouse is already obsolete. By the time it hits the store, it's it's history as far as we're concerned. That's how short the cycles we're getting, the, the innovation cycles. That's why we have that great benefit of getting smaller, cheaper, faster hardware every year. Now, IBM, understandably, was pretty upset about this. So uh, not too much later, as they kind of shifted from being a hardware company to becoming a consulting company, they decided they'd like to commoditize Windows. It's like a revenge play. And so they got heavily involved in the open source program in the 1990s. As a consulting company, free operating systems are a great complement to a consulting business. So again, they tried to commoditize the operating system by backing open source because it drove their, uh, their consulting business. By the way, it was a good tactic. It seemed to work for them. Uh, now, of course, Microsoft tried to use its hegemony on the desktop to extend and control the inter internet. If you think back to like 1996, 95, the browser wars, where Microsoft was breaking websites if they didn't comply with its browser, um, they might they might say that a little bit differently than what I just described, but that was my experience of it, at least at the time, as a web developer. Is, uh, it, was a, it was a huge hassle to try to, uh, as every different release of browsers, you know, the 2.0, 3.0, releases of Netscape and, and uh, Windows Explorer came out, it was a tremendous hassle to try to keep up with them because they, were not, they did not have standardized um, ways of looking at the web, and so websites would break in them. Uh, Microsoft's mission was to destroy Netscape, and they did. They succeeded. They, they bankrupted the company. And when AOL took over Netscape, and of course then AOL was acquired by Time Warner, what did they do? They open sourced Netscape browser. So they made it an open source, uh, the Mozilla Software Foundation was founded, and they open sourced it. Why? Well, because browsers are a great complement to the content business. Browsers are a way of consuming content. So if you're in the content business, Time Warner is a content company, you want to commoditize browsers. And by the way, it didn't hurt that it also kneecapped Microsoft. And um, now Firefox has emerged as the number one browser. And you know, for 10 years, Microsoft dominated the browser market. But now they've been displaced by Chrome and Firefox. There's a great diversity of browsers out there right now. And that has ceased to become as powerful a value control point um, for the internet. And so in a way, this is a little bit of a revenge play. But this is how companies use these standards. You know, they aren't going to comp they're not going to commoditize themselves, but they would love, they would dearly love to commoditize a rival company elsewhere. So this answers the question why Google gives away so many things for free. 
Um, you know, the folks at Berkshire, Berkshire Hathaway like to invest in businesses that they say have a moat around them, and Google is perhaps the most brilliant company in the world at protecting their moat. I'd call it a scorched earth policy. They give away stuff for free so that no rival can make any, has any chance of making a profit in their space. They get free email, they get free uh, hosting, free storage, free, if you want to upload videos to YouTube, you can store them there for free. They pay for all the hosting and streaming costs and so forth. And you might wonder, well, how do they make money with that? This is a very ugly chart, but you don't need to look with great detail to understand what the chart is. Over here, it starts in 1990, and it shows you, as the global internet population in that blue line goes up, Google revenues go up and locks up, actually accelerate. They grow faster than the growth of the internet. So basically, Google's proposition is make everything free or cheap, you know, including their Chromebooks, which are a couple hundred dollars. Their operating system for mobile, Android, is free. So uh, you know, they are absolutely commoditizing every possible complement so that they can increase the number of internet users, and thereby, that's how they make business. Their core product is AdWords. They monetize usage. They monetize users on the web. And so their revenue grows in lockstep with the number of users on the internet. So they're going to do everything they can to remove barriers from people who want to enter the internet. Well, that makes it extraordinarily difficult if you're in the business of selling operating systems for mobile phones, browsers, email, and so forth. They've basically made those businesses a scorched earth. There is no revenue opportunity in those. So it's worked extraordinarily well. The second law, the second power law of the jungle, cultivate your community. This is... Uh, Linus Torvalds, the, the, the shepherd, the leader of the open source project for Linux. And um, he has two great achievements. The, the first one, of course, is, the, is you know, creating an open source operating system, which he did. He led that process. Um, but the other part of it, everyone who talks about him says the other great part of it is the way he managed the community. So he understood that open source was community. There's a big shift. And Linux represents a big shift in open source. There was always a free software movement that had kind of like a religious overtone to it. Uh, it was like a jihad, you know, free software. Uh, he shifted that toward this open source uh, process, which really became the process of managing dispersed people, people who are geographically dispersed. And as they always point out, people who don't necessarily agree or even get along in person, they don't have to to participate in this thing. So they developed an art that was pioneering in the early days of Linux, but now it's become standardized. He invented Git, which is a repository, and now GitHub is the number one place where people will uh, host the, the repository for open source projects. So these tools for collaboration and community building are essential to the open source business, and that's really the second great achievement of Linus Torvalds. Uh, when I was early in the mobile business, in 1999 and 2000, I was visiting with a company, I'm not going to mention, they're in Scandinavia, they were a major vendor of infrastructure for mobile. And I was talking about developer program, and I wanted to find out about their developer tools, and they said, what's a developer network? This was not a concept that was well understood in telecom because these totally proprietary businesses, they did everything in, internally. So they didn't have to deal with third-party developers. They didn't have a partner's program. Software companies like Microsoft and Apple certainly did. They were well aware of the, of the need for that. Um, and they understood that you need to build a developer community. But many traditional businesses are still unclear about it. Right now I'm working with a lot of state and national lotteries. And I'm encouraging them to create a developer's program for game developers. And again, they're puzzled. They're saying, what's a developer network? Why do I need that? Why do I need a developer? Why do I need to open up my business to all these companies? Of course, the answer is because if you succeed in building a community, you're going to have a lot more innovation a lot faster because you're going to have a lot more smart, creative, investigative, curious minds working with you. So this has become kind of necessary for every business to develop this idea of a developer program. And I witnessed this happening in the mobile industry over a period of years. I was inspired because I had, I don't mean to keep going back to Sony, but Sony did so many things well in the 90s. When they launched the PlayStation, they were not the first in the, mobile, in the, in the games business. They were actually a latecomer. It was dominated by Sega and Nintendo at the time. In 1993, those were the two incumbents, and they were dominant. They were huge, a huge, huge install base. But Sony saw there was going to be a shift uh, to this, these new platforms, much different architecture, and they said, well, there's an opportunity for us to enter the market. So let's build a great console. But not only did they build a great console and sell it at a loss in order to get market share, they did another brilliant thing. They would do handstands for their developers. They went way out of their way to support their developers. If you were new to the PlayStation environment, everybody was, they would, they would say, we'll send an engineer down with a PlayStation, with, with a development machine, and we'll teach you how to use it. They, were, they catered to developers. You have to remember, at the time, if you wanted to be a developer for Nintendo, they were very haughty, they were very arrogant. 
you couldn't even get a meeting. They're like, we have our developer, our publishing partners, thank you very much. We don't need any more. We're, we're busy with the group that we've got. So Sony took this aggressive approach to embracing and really cultivating the developer community, they built a community. And as a result, they had the most successful game console ever in history, and that continues to this day. PlayStation 1, 100 million units sold. PlayStation 2, the most successful console in history, 150 million units sold. PlayStation 3, 80 million units sold. And PlayStation 4 sold a million units in the first weekend, the fastest growing sale of any new console in history. So Sony understands very well how to run a developer program. I had this opportunity myself just a few years ago when I, uh, I was working for Oprah Winfrey, and just as I left there, I was approached by a company in Germany that had built an incredible platform for games in mobile called Scoreloop. And um, their idea was basically to be the Zynga of mobile games. And I thought, that's a pretty cool idea. They were, um, they were from the banking business, and they understood that the social games where you're doing lots of little transactions and collecting lots of little points, they said, that's basically a microtransaction platform. And they had come out of the banking business that we know how to build that for mobile phones. We built it for banks. We could certainly build a game platform. They didn't know much about the game industry, per se. They wanted me to come join them and be the head of their game publishing. I was very interested. I went to visit them. But after a little while, I spoke to them and I said, you know what, don't do this. Don't hire me and don't set up a publishing company in California. That, was their, that had been their plan because they'd have to borrow $20 million from, from investors to do that, which meant that they would have to somehow get to $200 or $400 million valuation in order to satisfy those investors at the end. That's a really tough shot. I said, why don't you just open your platform up? Don't hire any publishing people. Don't even go in the game publishing business. Just open your platform up to developers. Put one person on part-time to manage your developer community. Well, that's what they did. They had one of the engineers on their team. They had, they had 20 engineers. It was a very small company, and they had one business development person. And so the business development person and the engineer went and started to cultivate a developer community. Six months later, they had 1,000 developers. They had thousands of games, many more than any publishing company could have produced by themselves. Thousands of games, and six months after that, they were acquired by BlackBerry for four times the amount that they had sought at as an exit. So it was a tremendous success story in a very, very short period of time for this small startup company. The main message there is cultivate your developer community. It is essential. Third law of the jungle, attain rapid scale. This is the fun part of the story. So since 2001, the world's changed tremendously. In 2001, I left Sony to join Packet Video, which is a mobile video company. People thought I lost my mind. I had the coolest job in television. I got to create all this new TV stuff. And I left to go into video on mobile phones. But I saw these numbers. There were 250 million people using the web, but there were twice as many mobile phones. And mobile phones were selling faster. And I thought, that's really interesting, because someday you'll be able to put a video signal or a game on those devices. It took a lot of imagination to see it back in 2000. Remember, they were black and white phones. And you could barely do a call with them when you were driving. They would drop the calls and so forth. So if you think back to that time, the phones weren't quite as powerful, and the signal wasn't quite as strong or as reliable as it is today. In just 10 years, look at the change. So we've got uh, 2.5 billion people using the internet. Actually, the number is growing. It's actually higher than that now. Six billion mobile phones in use. This year, 2014, there'll be more mobile phones in use than there are humans on the planet. Uh, there'll be three billion people. We're, very, we're approaching very rapidly a point where half the population of Earth will be using the internet in some form or another. And so with this enormous size, this tenfold increase that occurred in the last 10 years, it presents us with an entirely new concept of scale. So last year's numbers, there are 2.6 billion instant messaging accounts, 2.5 billion people using social networks, half of them on Facebook, 750 of them, half of them, using mobile versions of Facebook, more than a billion people watch YouTube every month. Half a million people using Twitter. <laughs> i sorry, half a billion. And at the bottom, these two stats, 74 million WordPress blogs and 170 million Tumblr blogs. I put that there because I think it's really important. That's not people reading, watching, or consuming. That's more than 200 million people publishing and creating content. So it's changing us, right? It's changing us from passive consumers into active participants in a dialogue. People wonder, why does it grow so fast? Why does it move so fast? One of the biggest reasons is that there are no boundaries. The internet surmounts all the traditional boundaries that gated our media businesses. Geographical boundaries, language boundaries, licensing business rules, and so forth. The internet sur surmounts all of that, transcends all of that. 
So a company like Facebook can grow to a billion users in a rapid period of time, but they're not stopping there. Mark Zuckerberg is already talking about his plans for the next billion, and his vision extends out to three to five billion users. They may never get there. I don't know if Facebook's gonna be around that long, but it's actually quite a heroic vision, right? It's hard to name other businesses that have a vision for five billion customers. And it's not just Facebook. This chart shows you the time it took to reach a million users or a million subscribers. And these are all fairly new services. As you can see, that interval shrinking really, really quickly now. Because so many people have mobile phones and it's so easy now to download something instantly to your phone and check it out at least once and use it perhaps if you like it, discard it if you don't. So the barriers to trying new things have vanished. And as a result, we can now launch a business that attains great scale, a million users in just a matter of weeks. Uh, here's another view on that same diagram. This is the time it took to reach 50 million people. And you can see radio took almost 40 years. But Draw Something, which was a game that Zynga acquired, it achieved that in 50 days. 50 days. It's amazing, isn't it? Here's a, these are the logos of some apps you may or may not be familiar with. Vine, Social Cam, um, Telly. These are, these are uh, social video or social photo apps. And here we see this dynamic. This is from 2012, but it was quite an extraordinary chart. I, I saw these two charts. They're both showing the same month, April to May of 2012. And this is on the left side, Social Cam, and on the right, Viddy, which are just two of many social video apps that are out there. And both of them went from zero to 40 million users in four weeks. So you can attain great scale very, very swiftly if you focus on mobile, if you bring a really small bite-sized proposition, it's not too complex, you can get to great scale very quickly. So we talk a lot about Facebook at 1.2 billion members, but we don't talk about all these other social networks, right? We, we tend to forget that there are hundreds of social networks out there, and most of them have tens of millions, some of them have hundreds of millions of users. Here's a, here's a stack, a, a chart that stacks up the social networks, and you can see at Facebook at, you know, at a, a 1.2 billion users has 50, more than 50% of the internet users already using it, already accessing it. Google Plus, which is a very new product, it's only a couple years old, is closing in fast, so they have, uh, they have half the size of the audience, but if you add YouTube together, then you can see that Facebook actually has an equivalent number of people using social media on there. I'm sorry, uh, Google has an equivalent number of people to Facebook using social media. The rest are Chinese. So most Americans that I know are unaware of companies like Weibo, and QQ, uh, Tencent, WeChat, and so forth, but these companies are aggressively launching social networks, and they're growing very quickly. In fact, in mobile, they're more successful than the American companies. People are shocked when I tell them that in the future, we'll probably use Chinese social networks. Sounds like a crazy idea, because software always comes from California first. Nobody buys Chinese software. But we used to say the same thing about Japanese cars when I was a little kid, and that changed. And I think in the future, it won't be so surprising to use software from China, as shocking as that sounds. Skype, a software product developed in Estonia, 280 million users, we, we all know that, right? It's gigantic uh, on a global basis, it's very popular outside the United States in particular, where international calling is expensive. But what we don't think about is that there are a bunch of other apps that have even larger numbers of users or equivalent sized audiences that do something similar. These are chat apps and messaging apps, a very fast growing area. And in the area of, of photos, we know Flickr with 87 million accounts, but do you even know about Camera 360? Has anyone even heard of Camera, camera 360? We have all heard of Instagram, of course. These are apps that are growing incredibly fast. My point here is it's not just Facebook. That's all you ever hear about in the press. People are always amazed and riveted by that gigantic size audience and the heroic ambition that they have to grow it to billions more. But what we miss in that story is that there are dozens and dozens, maybe hundreds of applications that reach audiences in the tens or hundreds of millions. Now, just to put that into contrast for you, today, a very successful TV show in primetime television in the United States would be considered a colossal smash if 10 million people watch it. That's a huge hit. 10 years ago, that would not have been such a big deal, right? 10 years ago on broadcast TV, that would have been normal. And 10 years before that, the show would have been canceled if it only got 10 million viewers. So there's a gigantic shift in user behavior, and we're reaching, we're reaching a size of audience or a scale of audience that is much bigger than anything traditional media companies are prepared to contend with or to think about. And we're only one third of the way there. So this great growth will continue. So the third law, then, is attain great scale. Focus on great scale. The fourth law, exploit free resources. There's a whole toolkit available to us today for an entrepreneur, a toolkit that 
just five years ago was unthinkable. I was launching a startup company five years ago, and I didn't have half of these things that exist today. The idea that everybody brings a mobile phone. You can assume your audience has a smartphone. That's an assumption you couldn't make in 2007. New materials that drive further miniaturization. Existing infrastructure that you can leverage. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. All kinds of free collaboration tools, not just tools for developers and, the, and your open source community, but also tools for your audience to collaborate and participate in a meaningful way. The social media marketing tools, uh, tools for crowdsourcing, where your crowd actually contributes content, ideas, energy to your process. Even crowdfunding sites, where you can finance your activity through fans. And of course, all the open platforms that we described earlier. Now, is Freeman in the audience? Yeah, OK, so Freeman, you're going to talk more about this later today. I'm not going to steal your thunder, then I'm going to move past it. The, the, I want to tie it back to my theme here, though. So earlier, I talked to you about the architecture of our era, the server, the client server architecture. And what's happening is we're layering on top of that now a social media layer. And that enables all kinds of new things to happen. Discovery, recommendations, sharing, organizing, even the funding of content and new services. So this is important for your entrepreneurs. Remember, in the beginning, I said leadership isn't just discovering ideas and figuring out why they're important. But the second part of leadership is explaining them to other people, connecting, having the charisma and the communication skills that connect with other people. That's where social media is so important. That's what entrepreneurs must understand. If you're going to attain great scale as an entrepreneur, you're not going to do it by borrowing venture capital money and spending your way there. You're going to do it by leveraging free resources on the internet. So all these tools, discovery, recommendations, sharing, and so forth, they give users, end users, the opportunity to participate in a meaningful way by publishing content, by curating content streams, by collaboration, sharing of ideas, communication with each other, those messaging apps that I talked about a minute ago, and of course social commerce, where consumers actually encourage each other to buy things, they endorse products, and so forth. I call this crowdsource transformation. And I can now tie my three concepts together here into one. Crowdsource transformation driven by social media, this shift from open source software to open source hardware, and the internet of everything. And let me show you how those three things work together in a virtuous cycle. This is what is so exciting about being an entrepreneur right now, is that these three trends coincide and accelerate each other. I'm talking about crowdfunding. There are more than 400 crowdfunding sites in the world. These are ones that are familiar to us in the United States. But just about every advanced country in the world has crowdfunding sites now. And this is a trend that is accelerating. A couple of years ago, we raised half a billion dollars. Last year, we raised $3 billion through crowdfunding. This is doubling and doubling and doubling. Motion pictures are now being financed by fans. This is the Veronica Mars, the TV show that was canceled. The movie studio that owned it didn't want to make the picture. But the director, the producer, and the actress were like, we want to make the movie. They wouldn't give them a budget. They said, well, there's a fan base, there's a fan base out there that wants to do it. So Rob Thomas, the producer, created a, a, a campaign on Kickstarter and reached out to his very active fan base. And he said, we want to make the money. Will you guys help us finance it? He set the goal of $2 million, and they raised $3 million in two days. Isn't that amazing? I mean, this took Hollywood by storm. But that's not the only amazing thing. If you look at Kickstarter, how many folks are familiar? You know what I'm talking about with Kickstarter. OK, yeah. So this is a crowdsource program uh, where you, you go and say, hey, I'm an entrepreneur. I've got an idea for a new product or a new film or a new game I want to make. Here's a video. Here's who I am. Here's my credentials. It's like a pitch. And you look for backers. And if you're smart, you're going to get your friends and family to support you so it looks like you have a little momentum. But it's a game. You have 30 days to attain your goal. And if you don't reach your goal in 30 days, you don't get the money, and the sponsors don't have to commit the funds to you. So it's a game. You have to reach your goal. And so that makes it very exciting and interesting for people. But there's a cool psychological effect that kicks in, which is if you back a project as a sponsor, it's something you're, you're excited about, and you see it might not reach its goal, you're going to start using social media to convince your friends to join in and participate in that program. So the people who are best at this are doing some extraordinary things. Now, um, at Kickstarter, Last year, 10% of the films at the, at the Sundance Film Festival were financed on Kickstarter in this fashion. So you know, Sundance is the independent film festival. It happens in, Cal in uh, Utah each year. And it's sort of like the hot film festival. It's where all the indie filmmakers go. So that's where the motion picture companies go to find the new talent. And what they're discovering now is that that talent is going directly to customers, going directly to fans to crowdfund the development of their motion pictures. That's a gigantic shift that never happened before. That's a, a huge sea change. And it's not just motion pictures. Ouya is a game console. A bunch of people from the game industry got together and said, hey, we want to create a new console using the Android operating system, open source. There's already a bunch of Android games for phones. We'll have all that available. 
and we're going to make a little a cool. They got um, they got um, uh, I'm trying to think of that guy's name. The the designer Eve Bahar to do the design for it, and um, and so it's a cool little silver box. They sought to raise a million dollars, and in the first weekend they raised a million. Two days after that, they raised $2 million, And by the end of the campaign, they had blown through $8 million. That's like a Series A and Series B financing for a startup company all collapsed into a four-week cycle, all from fans, all from people who say, I like this idea so much, I'll pay for it in advance of a product even existing. I'll back your, I'll back your action. I'll give you the money now for that product next year. It's an astonishing phenomenon. 3D printing, all the innovation in 3D printing from the consumer-grade pro, uh, printers, is happening on Kickstarter and other crowdfunding sites. This is the Buccaneer. And again, they set out to raise $100,000. They raised $1.5 million in 30 days. 3D Doodler, which is a, a, draw, a pen that allows you to draw 3D objects. It's sort of like a, kind of a glorified glue gun, I think. That's not a very nice way to put it, but that's what it seems like to me. Anyway, they set out to raise $30,000. They blew through that. They raised $2.3 million in their 30-day campaign. There are dozens of other 3D printing projects on Kickstarter. If you search Kickstarter for 3D, you'll see many other great innovators are out there talking to fans about this exciting idea of 3D printing, and they're getting backing and support from their fans in advance. It's not limited to 3D printing. Wearable, wearable watches, uh, the first actually big success on Kickstarter was the Pebble watch, which is really truly the first wearable computer wristwatch. And now there's all kinds of smart projects. Uh, Pine, they sought, out, they sought to raise $100,000. They raised $800,000. This is Agent, supposedly the world's smartest watch. It looks cool. They set out to raise 100000 They raised a million dollars. This is a different site called Indiegogo. It's, a, it's an alternative to Kickstarter, a rival, I suppose. Creos is another smart watch. Again, they raised $1.5 million. These are significant funding levels. This is kind of par. These are the most successful funding, so don't get me wrong. This is what most people experience. Most of the funding that happens on sites like Kickstarter is in the $10,000 range, much, much smaller. But one thing you'll notice is a consistent pattern here is the entrepreneurs are setting their goals modestly. They're saying, I want to raise $30,000, $20,000, $80,000, maybe $100,000. But then they have a sort of snowball effect because they reach that goal quickly, because it's a modest goal. And then all of a sudden, more and more people get excited about the idea, and they start pre-selling their products, and they can raise even more money. And there's a wonderful thing happening if you watch a Kickstarter campaign go on where the entrepreneurs come back every day. Right? They're on the site giving you new updates, going, wow, we blew through our goal yesterday. We tried to raise 100,000. We raised 200,000. So if we get another 1,000 people backing this, here's a few other goodies we're going to throw in. And they keep offering more better stuff. You know, We'll engrave your name on the back of it. We'll give you a special case. We'll give you an extra controller, or whatever the device might be. And so it gets very exciting for people. And this is a really, really cool idea. This is about communicating and connecting with fans which again is an essential skill for entrepreneurs. It's not just about designing hardware, developing a new solution. You have to communicate it to people. And here what we're talking about is communicating the value of the product before the product even exists. So social media is a fundamental change. It's actually transforming the way we learn about ideas. It's, it's transforming the way we, we find the ideas, discover them, talk about them, and ultimately fund them. That's a gigantic shift. The next power law, leverage someone else's investment. It's a great idea, right? Other people's money. Why spend your own money if you don't have to? Today, you don't have to. We have the cloud. In 2007, I was starting a company, and in our financing plan, we had to answer the investor question of how do you deal with scale? In the event that you get a massive onrush of user activity fast, how are you going to meet that demand? Because they didn't want your website to break. That was an issue. And so to answer that, we had to invest money, precious startup capital, in servers and rack space, infrastructure, stuff, stuff that today you just don't need to do. You go out to the cloud. You can buy infrastructure on demand. You can scale it as you need to. You just turn a knob. We're all familiar with these sites, Netflix, Airbnb, Pinterest, Spotify, Scribd. These are some of the most exciting new digital services that have been introduced in the past five years. They all have one thing in common. You know what it is? Amazon, somebody said, yeah. They're all run on Amazon Web Services. It's extraordinary. So Amazon is the master of the API. About more than 10 years ago, Jeff Bezos sent out a memo to everybody. He said, I don't want memos. I don't want interoffice communication or meetings anymore. Just your department should publish an API to the other departments. And if they want to use the services in your department, they can just write to your API and take advantage of it. No more meetings, no more memos. 
once they did that, they were like, why don't we open these APIs up to the rest of the world? And they did. And this is an extraordinary story that isn't told enough. Amazon is perhaps the most brilliant company in all of digital media. They are truly rewriting the rules. So they needed a huge amount of infrastructure to run their internet services. They said, why don't we open it up? Let's give an API to people so that they can leverage this themselves. And one of the things that Amazon has done to be so successful in, in, uh, in the web services in, um, in the cloud is that they continuously drop the price. They don't raise their price, they're dropping their price. It defies logic. It's extraordinary, because they're growing so fast they can afford to keep cutting the cost. And that means that they have the lion's share of, uh, of web hosting, web services, or cloud services today. So it's an extraordinary story from Amazon. 1% uh, of all internet traffic runs across their servers on any given day. One third of internet users touch one of their servers, and they are the, large, the fourth largest content distribution network in the world right now. And nobody even knows this. It's like just a little sort of side business that they have. It's a pretty big business. So the way my friend Andrew Hessel put it when we were talking about biotech is he said the next biotech billionaire is going to start his company at a Starbucks with a laptop and a cell phone. Isn't that extraordinary? But it's really true. This has knocked out the need for startup companies to raise tremendous amounts of capital from skeptical investors and earmark it for software and servers and stuff that if they go belly up are just going to be auctioned off at, at bargain prices. That's a terrible waste of capital. Now you just don't need to do it. Other people's money. Leverage other people's investments. The sixth law, build your proprietary data asset. This is perhaps the most important thing I have to share with you today. When I visited Union Square Ventures in New York, I was talking to them about a project, and they said, I don't see it. I said, why not? They said, we don't see what the proprietary data asset is. I said, well, what do you mean by that? And they said, well, we only invest in businesses where more users contribute more data, and that data becomes something proprietary to that service. So they are investors in Twitter. Uh, they're investors in a number of the microblogging platforms and other communication. But you think about those services, the more people use them, the more data is created, the more that that data asset grows. This is crucial. You see, uh, a lot of futurists, I don't really call myself a futurist as a nice introduction, but a lot of futurists will grant, make these grand pronouncements like this one, data is the new oil, right? We've been hearing this buzzword for a few years. What do you mean by that? What do you really mean by that? Yeah, I mean, there's a kind of a boom, right? An oil boom, maybe a gold rush mentality around it. I look at it a little differently. I agree with the phrase. The way I look at it is data is a giant untapped resource. It's like a natural resource, except it grows at an incredibly rapid rate. And so every business that you launch today, if it's going to have software and apps in it, and I believe all of them will, that means there will be data, there will be metrics, there will be information gleaned from that, and that will become a very, very valuable part of your business. Check out these charts. So this is a chart that's from a couple years ago. It's from the, uh, the Economist magazine. And um, it showed the available storage versus the amount of information created. The reason I share this with you is that in 2010, we crossed an important threshold, which is that we created a zettabyte of data in, uh, in, in 2010. That's an extraordinarily large amount of data. A zettabyte is a one followed by 21 zeros. It's a very large amount. You could fill a football stadium with DVDs and still not have a, data, a zettabyte of data. But that's not, the, that's not the most extraordinary part. What's extraordinary is that chart projected out continues to grow. Uh, so another source, IDC, the digital, resource, digital Universe Study, they said in 2010 we had almost created a zettabyte. By, 20, by, by 2009 we'd almost created a zettabyte. It was, it was almost uh, you know, 0.8. By 2010, we, we surpassed it. We created 1.2 zettabytes. But by 2020, we're going to create 35 zettabytes of data a year. So data is growing at an extraordinary rate. I, can't, I don't have time to dwell on this more, but just simply the main message there is understand what the proprietary data asset at the heart of your software is. How does your system get smarter with more users? How can you learn from more users and improve your product? That's the question that I would ask every entrepreneur. If they can't answer it, I send them back to the drawing board, as Union Square Ventures did with me. The seventh law, master your ecosystem. The story of the demise of Nokia is an extraordinary story. It's an extraordinary story. In 2007, Nokia was dominant, utterly dominant. They controlled the smartphone market. It appeared to me that they were going to win. They had just open sourced their Symbian operating system. It looked like they were making all the right moves, but in fact, they were in a state of rapid decline and they didn't even know it. Stephen Elop joined them from Microsoft and, uh, about three years ago, and when he arrived there, he was alarmed to discover the situation was worse than he had thought, and he published this famous memo called the Burning Platform Memo. I'm not going to recap the whole thing, but he pointed out that their competitors weren't taking market share with devices. He meant Apple and Android. 
They weren't stealing market share with devices, they were stealing market share with an ecosystem that included a great big developer network and the APIs to support those developers and all the apps that the developers built. That's the ecosystem. And so you must understand the new ecosystem. If you're gonna operate in the space where intelligent devices are connected to networks and they talk to each other and they share data, you must understand this ecosystem. The future business landscape is gonna be controlled by entirely new value, value points, value control points that have been introduced. We can identify, here are four of them that I know well. The tools to create new content and apps, ways to discover content and information, ways to monetize those apps, and new ways to consume them. So if you take a company like Apple, you move Apple over and you can map every product they have against those four quadrants. You can see every, every, every product made by Apple includes tools for content creation, great tools. You know, iPhoto comes with every computer that's sold. Uh, they have a great developer program. They have great tools for discovery. I put Siri there because I believe Siri is their way to combat Google. Siri is their vision of the future of search. You'll talk to your device. You're not going to go to a search web page or a search bar and type in a search query. You'll just talk to your device. Your device will be smart enough to find it for you. So in that way, uh, Siri is about discovery. Monetization, Apple continues to dominate. They are the number one source of digital revenue for most media companies and all the apps companies and mobile companies. And consumption, Apple's done a brilliant job of making desirable devices, des devices that are so, so attractive, as Steve Jobs said, they're so attractive people want to lick them. But then if you take Google and you apply the same chart, you can actually map everything Google does to it. Too. So you can look at the left and you say, oh yeah, they have a lot of tools for content creation. They have a robust developer program around the world. They also have mastered master the art of discovery. Um, you know, I have uh, uh, Google, of course, search there, but if you, um, if you haven't checked out Google Plus, you should. It's growing very quickly. It was derided as a Facebook clone, but I believe Google's got a much different strategy. I think it's worth checking that out. And Google Now, have you got, who's got an Android phone and uses Google Now? It's, an, it's great, isn't it? I mean, actually, it's better than some of the Apple apps that are out there. It's really very impressive. In terms of monetization, um, Google got a lot of pushback from game developers and app developers because you couldn't monetize apps quite as well in their store. But that's over now. Now they're almost at par with Apple. So they're, they're, they're monetizing content quite well. But where Google dominates is advertising. And so they have this incredible cash engine. That's what drives all that free stuff that they're able to give away, that free stuff that scorches the earth to would-be rivals. And then to, in terms of consumption, now they have a product in every category that Apple has a product in. They just introduced a desktop computer, a Chrome-based desktop computer. And so they compete with Apple toe-to-toe -to -toe on hardware as well. And now with owning Motorola, um, they're going to extend that. By the way, did you notice that um, Google quietly acquired eight robotics companies in the past few months? Yeah, kind of an amazing thing, right? So if you were in the robotics industry right now, I think you'd, you'd be sh you know, shaking in your boots looking at this. You'd go, gosh, what's Google's play? Robotics is an extraordinarily difficult business to make money in. It's expensive. And we're not talking about a phone. We're talking about a thing that moves. It has all kinds of mechanical parts. That's a gigantic challenge. The engineering challenges there are massive. The costs involved are massive. And now Google, with all their cash, all their R&D, what are they going to do? They're going to commoditize the hardware, right? Commoditize your complement. They're going to push operating systems. And I think they're going to do the same thing in the car business. That's what the point of the robotic car is. It's not that Google's going to make a car. Google's going to sell operating systems to car companies, or maybe they'll give them away free, and they'll glean all that location data that goes right back to their proprietary data asset. It all fits together. You could apply the same criteria to Facebook, Microsoft, Amazon, and any other major company in the space. But I think it's a useful exercise to say, okay, what is the ecosystem that that company operates in, and what are all their tools and programs that support it? And at the heart of it is a proprietary data asset. How does all that activity drive value into that proprietary data asset? Uh, I have this handy chart, which you can't read. I'm going to give these slides to you so you'll be able to take them home and look at it. And you might share this with your students. And this is hardly comprehensive, but I've tried to give you some of the key points I just covered. So to summarize, I think the future is actually easy to predict. And I'm trying to equip you with the same analytic skills that I use, the same analysis that I apply to figure out where to invest next or what business to get into next. The first question is, what part of my business consists of information? It's a good question, right? Many, many, many products companies do not consider themselves to be in the information business. And I like to remind them that if you're going to be selling, the new bundle is a product, hardware, that comes with software, that has network access, and some kind of content or application on top of it. That is the new, new value bundle. Every one of those Internet of Things devices that I showed you, they, are that, they consist of that bundle. Hardware, software, content, and access. 
So what part of your product consists of information? And can you push that piece so far that it becomes its own self-standing business? In fact, can you turn your product into a service? That's the second question. Can you get away from the economics of selling single units and get into the business of recurring revenue, selling an ongoing service, whereby the hardware, the razors, are commoditized, and the value goes to your information asset and the service? And finally, how can I leverage other people? How can I leverage the crowd to propel my innovation even faster? This is really hard for entrepreneurs because they think they're the creative ones. It's the ego of the entrepreneur. You need a certain amount of ego strength to launch a business. So the entrepreneur says, I'm the one with all the ideas. I've got the vision. I'm Steve Jobs. OK, not everybody's going to be Steve Jobs. The smart entrepreneur does the Zen thing and opens up, opens up an API, opens up a developer program, creates a community around it, maybe opens up his source code and invites people to participate and finds other ways to monetize around it. Because that way, he's going to harness the creativity and ingenuity and innovation of thousands, maybe millions of other people. And finally, at the core, what is my proprietary data asset? In success, at scale, when millions of people are using this, what information gets generated and how do I make a business around that? Remember that everything that can be expressed as information will be, whether your company does it or not, whether your entrepreneurs do it or not. If they just make products, someone else will find a way to glean the information from those products, and they'll extract the information asset from that. That's all I've got for you today. I appreciate your time. Thank you. I know it was a little bit long. But I wanted to share all that stuff with you.